Welcome back to the programme. Now, it has to be said, it's fairly unusual in a household for a dad to go out the door to school every day while the kids stay at home. But that was the setup of our next guest, Monica O'Connor and Eddie O'Neill, who have six kids that have been um, more or less continually homeschooled, as they call it. You're both very welcome indeed to the programme. Mm -hmm. How did all this come about? I suppose we were very lucky when our first child, before he was a year old, I met a family down in Kilkenny who were home educating their kids and it made a lot of sense to me. I really enjoyed being with my child when he was small and I didn't see why his learning to read and write and things that we associate with school should come at any other pace than his learning to talk or learning to walk and it all unfolded very, very naturally. And what about the law that says get in there to school Get your school bag and your lunch box. In today. Ireland, I suppose, Marion, we're very fortunate in that the Constitution says that the family is actually the prime educator and it gives parents the explicit right to educate at home if they so choose. So we're very blessed with that, I suppose. It's a great protection and, and is quite unusual. I suppose in Europe, there are plenty of countries where it's actually illegal. So we have protection in Ireland. Right. But, Sorry, so someone yes. said to me the other day, um, since the cold case, people have been ringing up all over the country and someone said you keep talking about it's your right but it's actually also your duty so as parents we have a duty to kind of ensure that our children grow up yeah. and, and become responsible uh, adults in society and responsible young people in society you know and that they learn how to communicate properly they learn how to um, have moral moral awareness and emotional awareness and all those things so it's kind of like a, a duty as well as a, as a right you know tell me about the court case um, well <laughs> We we were we were sent school attendance notices, right? Uh, which means we somebody decided that Elva and Aaron have to go into school. Now Elva and Aaron are we say we've six children, so three, three lads are off. They're they're, they're done, out, and dusted. done and dusted. Yeah, they're out in the doing their own thing, and um, so Elva and Aaron are next in line. So they they we got a school attendance notice, which means that uh, well we think it means that we have to send them into school. But it explicitly says in the Constitution, the state shall not oblige parents to send their children to school. So we went into the school and just asked the principal, just said, listen, we know that we have enough to be doing without having to worry about whether our children are coming into you. Yeah. And, um, so we said we will be continuing to educate the children at home. So then we got summoned to go to court and... Uh, we went into court, the hearing. You see, we were kind of learning this as we go along. It's really an experience because um, we went into court the first day and the judge said that, well, if this is about the Constitution, I have no, con I have no jurisdiction. Right. And then there was a hearing fixed. And so at the end of the hearing, we were fined 500 euros for each child each and uh, convicted of failing to cause the children to go to school, even though it says in the Constitution... The state shall not, not oblige parents. Right, so it's confusing, yeah. So that's a... Uh, did you at. pay it? Oh, no. No, no. <laughs> Will you pay it? We'll see what... Well, we don't even know. Like, So, if, what if we pay the, the... If we pay the money, what... Like, does that... Do we, are we allowed to have a constitutional right then? Or what... Like, what's... It's, it's very confusing. Like, we just feel, We were given a choice in court, actually. It was very interesting. Which I, I, after you kind of think... What did that happen? When you're in the middle of it, it's very emotional, kind of. Yeah. You know, and you're up and you're down, you're wondering, oh, is this the healthiest way to go? Or is this the safest way? Or is this the best way? You're just kind of thinking on your feet a lot of the time, you know. And um, But at the end of the court hearing, we were given a choice that if we register, um, you won't have to, you won't be convicted and you won't have to pay a fine. But if you don't register, you'll be convicted and you'll have to pay a fine and you'll have to pay court costs. We were thinking, if you're guilty, you're guilty. How can you be guilty and then... Sort of guilty. S sort of guilty. Yeah. And, uh, agree to be guilty and uh, do what we tell you and uh, you'll be grand and we let you off. Uh, but it, can you not register and and um, and carry on regardless? Well, I, I, you, you started off with your first child yeah. and then you decided that you liked it. Absolutely. So as the other children came. And how did that all work? I mean, did people come and inspect that you were actually teaching them anything? Well, the first guy was born in 1986. He's 26 now. So the Education Welfare Act, under which you're meant to apply for assessment, wasn't in, in force until 2000. It was voted in in 2000 and in force from 2002. So we, I suppose, had three children who were kind of 
well up before the law was enacted, if you know what I mean. Um, what they're actually asking you to do, we would say that there's a conflict, as we read it as lay people, between the Education Welfare Act and our rights under the Constitution. They're asking you to apply and be assessed. And if the assessor says that you're providing a certain minimum education for the child in your home, you're allowed your constitutional right. Now, as far as I'm concerned, the Constitution applies to all the citizens of Ireland and you're entitled to your constitutional right. And nobody should come and say, you're good enough to have your constitutional right but sorry you're not well but you might have somebody who isn't i mean you might have somebody i mean we'll, we'll go through i mean the kids have all done terribly well and all that but supposing you two were illiterate and supposing you know that you you couldn't assist them i mean you're a maths teacher you i mean the state would have to look after the child as well and the state absolutely does have have duties towards the children of of the country and i suppose we feel that we have a particular um focus on vulnerable children because we have been foster carers for, for 10 years and we have fostered 21 children, you know, so we do know something about about vulnerability and about when the state needs to, to, to step in. Yeah. But whether assessment is actually the way that's going to protect any child, like as the law as it stands, they don't even have to meet the child. You could decide as if you wanted to be a hoodwinking kind of a parent and use home education as a cover for God knows what, but you could decide to meet the assessor in some venue away from your home. They don't actually have to see the child and they can assess that you're providing a minimum education. So the law as it stands doesn't yeah. actually protect vulnerable right. children. But, but, but we have no problem with signing up to something where we would all, you know, home educators would be encouraged to say, join a support group, get some input. You know, we save the state thousands in capitation fees yeah. to know that they pay for other and home education parents aren't given a book grant <coughs> an OPW membership card a museum card there's no help do you know we, we take on the responsibility the right and the duty of educating yeah. our children are very happy to do that yeah now you, you, you have six mm -hmm. and three have gone through did the three that went through ever go to school? Some of them did, some of them didn't. None to primary. So a first guy decided to try out first year in secondary school and came out for a year then while we were building our home and he went in then in transition year. So no junior cert. I never put anyone through the junior cert. He did do transition year at fifth and sixth and did a leave insert. Went to Cork, did a couple of fall to Ireland courses in bar skills and hospitality and is now um, working in the bar of a golf club in Hawaii. Right. And he says it's paradise on earth. Right. You know, when I've had my little fits of, oh God, you're the first I was experimenting. Did I do all right by you? He said, ma'am, I live in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He'll, he'll be home now in three weeks' time. And he and, and you, because I've heard you talk about it before, you d have devised a system whereby the children dictate the pace. But does that mean you are a teacher in the home? Absolutely day, not. And, and I suppose uh, um, a guy did a, a, a documentary on our kids. It's called Homegrown Knowledge and it's available there on YouTube. And uh, what you have is the kids talking themselves about how they're the active people. Like I did, when, at the start I was anxious and I said, what if I can't teach such and such or whatever, you know. And I did a Montessori course just as a fallback insurance, you know. But I've realised now that it doesn't matter what I want to communicate or what my children want. It's it's what they want to learn. And they will say this, they're the active people. Do you know, you could be the, the most gifted <laughs> communicator teacher on the planet, you could have a lesson plan devised, you could have the best resources and the child might just not be interested in that you could decide to teach fractions on the day that a child is just on fire to learn about songbirds, so go with the songbirds, you'll get your literacy, you'll get your numeracy, you'll get everything through that if you follow the child's interests, like our, our third guy has gone into DIT without the leave insert, he's just finished first year music, he's only 17 and he got in there with no junior no uh, national school no secondary school, no leave insert no, no junior cert and he's finished his first year of his degree in college. Second guy's just finished two years of drama and he did two and a half years of secondary school. So I suppose the, the lesson that we would like our children to learn and that there is that there isn't only one way to do anything. Right. And you know, home education, you don't need to be a teacher um, but you just need to be to love being with your children. Really, you just need to love being with them. Yeah, I, I would see it as uh, you have such an opportunity to create uh, ways of that your children feel loved that you actually, they feel love that, oh, I'm doing this. It could be painting a picture of uh, a fox or something like that. And just to sit down with them and spend time, just and they feel loved. It's, it's a very different thing to say, oh, God, I love you, as you're going out the door. Because you're going out the door. But when, to actually spend time with your children and, and that they feel, they feel loved. And, and that has come to me now recently about that thing about socialisation that people talk about. You know, yeah. people wonder about socialisation. That's another question that often comes up. Yeah. And actually, we were talking the other day about all the children and we were thinking, and they were saying, well, actually, socialisation means that if you're confident enough in your own skills and your own abilities and your own self, well, then socialisation won't really be an issue. 
So you find that with whole children who are educated at home, they, 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 they feel loved so that they feel happy with themselves. So they, they have the skills and the desire to communicate with people and to share ideas and to share thoughts. So we find that so whole socialisation doesn't really happen, you know, for, for children who are educated at home. And do they have friends outside of the family? Loads of friends. Yes, that's your, yeah, their Facebook. This is it. It's a kind of... We're just an ordinary family. Like we, we're kind of thinking, why are we on the Marion Panookin show? Because we've been doing this for 25 years, you yeah. know. And, um, and yeah, there's another thing then as well. I, I've, I've yet to meet a child who's educated at home who feels bullied. Whereas I know a number of children who are now educated at home because they felt bullied in school. You know, so it, it's to me that's a big one as a, as a teacher in school. There's, a, there's something there that I've noticed. You know? And did you teach them all the maths? No, they learn maths. You see, it's brilliant. I think that was it Elva when I really, it really, the penny really dropped for me. God, you don't actually have to work at parenting. You just get out of the way and let the child develop and they'll do all the work for you and enjoy the crack with them and enjoy living with them and enjoy growing up with them. You know, that's, that's what I've learned anyway. Yeah. You know, and, and who am I to, to, to tell another human being the, the best, what you should be doing and what you should, you, you kind of guide them as best you can to, to appreciate that they're part of a bigger picture and they belong to a community and family. And, yeah, but, but when did you, do, I mean, how did they arrive at learning to read and write? There were books all around. They saw they saw that everybody always has a book in their hand. And what well, like we have five boys and one girl. And what any teacher or anybody who deals with teenage boys will tell you, the biggest problem is trying to get that cohort to be interested in any kind of a book. Do you know what I mean? But our lads are always reading. Um, my sister-in-law came over and she saw some of the teenagers sitting in chairs and said, is this the reading hour? She thought it was a sign, do you know, but our, all of ours are interested in how they actually came to it. Like the guy who's 12 now, he wanted to play soccer with his friend and they had to, their their version of it was they were playing one-on-one, -on -one, but they had to do teams for each other and they had to learn to write the names. So he'd say, right, you take Messi and I'll take Ronaldo and, do you know, and, and there's only one-on-one, -on -one, but they had a team of, of, of 11 each. And so he had to learn to spell and write through that. A lot of it would three What age was he? He was eight, I think, at that point when that when that made sense to him. And so you often find with kids who are educated at home, they read a little bit older or later than, than the, the norm. They to read later, you know, yeah. One of the families we know, the boy was, he was 11 and three quarters and he could not, I mean, could not read. That guy is now in his 30s. He's done a master's in librarianship. Do you know, he's like, if you go with the child's interests and they go from reading nothing to reading very organically, it's, it's amazing because... Reading is important in our home. We're all reading at different times. You're reading to them. You don't need a specific method of yeah. instruction. They'll ask for help, you know, and it might be a birthday cards to Granny is how birthday they start writing. Birthday cards seems to be a way that they start to get into it. All, and become, then they want to write to their friends. They want to write to their friends and, and they'll say, how do you spell happy? And then they'll, get a, they'll make a connection, you see. Connection's first important. They'll make a connection with a ha <laughs> sound as a H and an A and a PP. And, and, they, and the letters start coming and then they're into it and they're, it's interest. So now they have an interest. They've connected with something and they have an interest. And when you have an interest in something, you learn it. And, and they all see writing as important. They all see that yeah. they can actually write their own books. They don't have this idea that, you know, it's something off and that, you know, only special authors can do this. They're all engaged and, right. you know, reading, yeah. happy and doing that. And what age are your school age ones now? Okay, so the youngest guy is five and then nine. Our girl is five, uh, is nine and then twelve. And so the 17-year-old is in, in university now. Right. And, and do you figure your legal battle is going to continue? Well, I, I'd say it will, yeah. <laughs> it, it answered in a... Um, It'll be nice we're just for confused clarity, to tell you the truth, Mary. It's just... You know? it, it, it's like a very easy way to... I think we're treated as people who are not in school rather than people who whose children are educated at home. You know, so... Um, and it's about family as well. Like, so we, 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 for us as a family, like, we're, we're protecting our family. We feel our family's been protected. We think, we've kind of looked at the constitution now because we kind of had to. And we think family, everyone has a family. Like, everybody, to listen to this program here today, if you just take a breath for a second, just say, right, if you have one day to live, how would you spend it? How would you spend that day? And most people will say, with my family, with my friends. And it's about family. And we feel our family and our family's way of doing things as our duty to educate our children our, is being attacked right. by the, 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 the thing that the entity, the state, which is sworn to protect us. You know, that's the way we feel about it. And uh, we love being Irish. We love the whole thing of being Irish. You can't explain it to somebody who's not Irish. How did the kids learn Irish? 
They, well, they, they, or did they? They did, oh yeah. Oshin went over to the Gael. He loves it. He, they love speaking. They, just they actually them. would talk just to each other. Yeah. They went did a couple of summers in Splother over in, in uh, Galway and absolutely loved it. Like in preparation for going into secondary school, they said, okay, they really had a cut of and, you know, just a few phrases and yeah. then came back just... And, and actually one of the guys in college now, he said, can I borrow an Irish dictionary? We're going to start trying to play Scrabble in Irish. So you, nobody has set them that task, but they're interested but themselves also, in it. Yeah, one thing I remember them saying is, God, Irish is a lovely... Like, you kind of... It's a kind of a can you can it's a you connect with people kind of language you know it it, it makes so much sense when they started speaking the the, the words the, the the phrases made so much sense to them it was a right. very interesting thing you know right um, how did you get involved in the fostering we I'd say myself and Monica are the old we're both oldest in our families you know of six, of, each, of yeah. six each kind you know and yeah. I suppose we we were being the eldest you kind of look after other children you know when you're growing up. Yeah, um, and you pass, that's the way life seems, seems to happen but we kind of seem we've always kind of wanted to do it it's always just been part of it it never really was oh god we'll be fast it just was a matter of time I think even when we were building the house we had an opportunity to build a house there about 13 years ago and we kind of built an extra room so for in case we were going to foster you know so it was, it was just part of us we're that kind of people we just we, just love, we uh, think that we've been very lucky and we're very yeah. blessed and that really, like what Eddie says to the kids a lot, is you need to be grateful and you need to share. Do you know, and the only way to, to show your gratitude is to share with other human beings. Right. And I suppose we see fostering in that light. Yeah. Right, OK, well, we will, as they say, uh, follow with interest what, you, what happens from here. <laughs> and we'll have a look on YouTube as well. Listen, thank you both yes. very, very much indeed for coming in. Thanks for having us in. Mm -hmm.